by extract is recapitulation from a work written by Monsieur Montferrand, which was published in 1820. The author has bestowed great care on the collection of official and authentic documents, and he has availed himself of the information furnished by preceding writers. I am therefore of opinion that this work is unquestionably the best that has been written on this subject. Monsieur de Montferrand is far from being favorable to Napoleon. However, it is but just to admit that he maintains a tone of impartiality which does credit to his character while at the same time it enhances the merit of his work events. On the 2nd of May, Napoleon opened the campaign of Saxony by the victory of Lutzen, a most surprising event, and one which reflects immortal honor on the conquerors. A newly embodied army without cavalry marched to face the veteran bands of Russia and Prussia. But the genius of the chief and the valor of the young troops whom he commanded made amends for all. The French had no cavalry, but bodies of infantry advanced in squares flanked by an immense mass of artillery presenting the appearance of so many moving fortresses. 84,000 infantry consisting of French troops or troops of the Confederation with only 4,000 cavalry beat 107,000 Russians or Prussians with more than 20,000 cavalry. Alexander and the King of Prussia witnessed the conflict in person. Their celebrated guards could not maintain their ground against our young conscripts. The enemy lost 18,000 men. Our loss amounted to 12,000, and our want of cavalry prevented us from reaping the usual fruit of our conquests. However, the moral result of the victory was immense. The enthusiasm of our troops resumed its ascendancy, and the emperor recovered the full influence of opinion. The allies retreated before him without venturing the chance of another battle. On the 9th, Napoleon entered Dresden as a conqueror, conducting back to his capital the king of Saxony, who, from the consciousness of his own interests, as well as the wish to remain faithful to his engagements, had retired on the approach of the Allies, whose proposals he had constantly projected. On the 21st and 22nd, Napoleon again triumphed at Verkin and Bautzen. The Allies had chosen their ground, which the brilliant campaigns of Frederick had rendered classic. They had entrenched themselves, and they thought their position impregnable, but everything yielded to the grand views and well-conducted plans of the French general, who, at the very commencement of the conflict, declared himself to be certain of the victory. The Allies lost 18,000 or 20,000 men. They were unable to retain their position, and they retired in disorder. The Emperor pursued them. He had already passed through Lusatia crossed Silesia and had reached the odor when the Allies demanded an armistice to treat for peace, and Napoleon, thinking the favorable moment had arrived, granted it. On the 4th of June, the armistice of Placewitz was entered into. This event had the most decisive influence in producing our misfortunes. It was the fatal knot to which were attached all the chances and destinies of the campaign. Should the emperor have granted this armistice or have followed up his advantages, this was at the moment a problem which time and the events that have proved so fatal to us solved when too late the emperor crowned with victory halted before his fallen enemies to whom he could now make concessions without compromising his dignity his sacrifices could be regarded only as moderation Austria, who they are too uncertain as to what course she should pursue, struck with our success, rejoined with us. Napoleon now reasonably hoped to see the ratification of a peace, which he hoped for, and he would not let slip so favorable an opportunity to incur the risk of a check that might have lost all, and which was the most likely to take place since his army had marched forward in haste and in the utmost disorder, and his rear was uncovered and crossed by the enemy, he conceived that the armistice at all events afforded him an opportunity of concentrating and reorganizing his forces and opening his communications with France, by which means he would be enabled to receive immense reinforcements and to create a corps of cavalry. Unfortunately, in spite of all the emperor's calculations, this fatal armistice proved advantageous only to our enemies. It was maintained for nearly three months, and it served only to bring about their triumph and our destruction. 
Austria, who is still our ally, by a deception which history will justly characterize, availed herself of that title to oppose us with the greater advantage. Requiring delay, she obtained it. The Russians, who were waiting for reinforcements, received them. The Prussians doubled their numbers. The English subsidies arrived. And the Swedish army rejoined. Secret associations were put in full activity. A general insurrection of the whole German population was excited, while at the same time the defense of the cabinets of the Rhenish Confederation and the corruption of the Allied officers were successfully affected. Treason also began to creep into the superior ranks. General Germini, the chief of the staff of one of our army corps, went over to the enemy with all the information he had been able to collect respecting the plans of the campaign. The result sufficiently proved to the emperor all the errors of the armistice and convinced him that he would have done better had he obstinately pressed forward. For had he continued successful, the Allies, alarmed at finding themselves deprived of the aid of Austria, with whom they could no longer have maintained intelligence cut off from the Prince of Sweden, who would have remained behind, seeing the fortresses of the Oder unblockaded, and the war carried back to Poland, to the gates of Danzig, amidst the people ready to rise in a mass, the Allies, I say, would infallibly have concluded a treaty, if, on the other hand, we'd sustained a reverse, the consequences could not have been more fatal than those which were actually experienced. The wise calculations of the emperor ruined him. That which he might have regarded as inconsiderateness and temerity would probably have saved him. Congress of Prague on the 29th of July, after two months of difficulties and obstacles, the Congress opened under the mediation of Austria, if indeed the term Congress can be properly applied to an assembly in which no deliberations took place, and of which one party had determined beforehand that none should be held. The mediator and the adversaries were equally our enemies, all concurred in their hostility to us, and they had already decided on the war. Why then did they wait? Because Austria still possessed a shade of modesty, and she wished in the debates to gain a pretense for declaring war against us. Prussia and Russia, on their part, thought it necessary to preserve their credit in Europe by this false manifestation of their desire and their efforts to preserve peace. All were merely affixing the seal to their Machiavellian system. To them, the real Congress was not the Assembly at Prague. It had already taken place two months before. Time has since thrown into our hands the authentic records of the intrigues, machinations, and even treaties in which they were engaged during that interval. It is now evident that the armistice was resorted to by pretended friends and avowed enemies only for the sake of artfully cementing the union that was to effect the overthrow of Napoleon and creating the triumvirate which was destined to oppress the Europe while it pretended to deliver her. Austria had, from interested motives, long delayed the opening of the Congress of Prague, resolved to repair her losses at any price. She did not hesitate to sacrifice her honor, the better to ensure her success. She masked her perfidy under the disguise of friendship, declaring herself our ally and eagerly complimenting us on every new triumph. She insisted with an air of the warmest interest on being our mediatress. When she had already entered into an agreement to make common cause with our enemies, her propositions were accepted, but she wished to gain time for her preparations, and thus every day fresh obstacles were started while the utmost tardiness was evinced in settling them. Austria at first offered her services as a mediatress, but changing her tone in proportion as her warlike preparations advanced, she soon signified her wish to become an arbitress, at the same time intimating that she expected great advantages in return for the services she might render. At length, after an armistice of two months, when Austria thought herself perfectly prepared and when everything was agreed upon among the coalesced powers, they opened the Congress not to treat a peace and to establish amicable relations, but to develop their real sentiment and to insult us unreservedly. The Russians in particular behaved with unusual ill grace. They were no longer the Russians who anxiously solicited an armistice after the routes of Lutzen, Verkin, 
and Bautzen. They now looked upon themselves as the dictators of Europe, which indeed they have since really become by the spirit of their diplomacy, the blindness of their allies, their geographical situation, and finally by the force of things. But whom did Alexander select as his minister to this Congress? Precisely what who, by personal circumstances, was according to the laws of France, unqualified for such a post, one who was by birth a Frenchman. Certainly it would have been difficult to offer a more personal direct insult. Napoleon felt it. But he concealed his resentment. Under such circumstances, much could not be expected from the Congress. During the few days of its sitting, our enemies merely drew up a series of notes more or less acrimonious, while the conduct of Austria was marked by the most odious partiality. On the 10th of August, only two days after the first meeting of the negotiators, the Russians and Prussians haughtily withdrew. And on the 12th, Austria, that faithful ally, that obsequious and devoted friend who had shown herself so eager to become our mediatress and arbitress, suddenly laid aside those titles to declare war against us, allowing no interval save that required for the signature of the manifesto, which she had been for two months secretly concerning with her new allies and which will ever be of record of her shame and degradation since it acknowledges the sacrifice of an archduchess to the necessity of crouching before a detested ally history will decide on these acts however to the honor of the throne and of morality there is reason to believe that the most of these transactions and in particular the real course of affairs was unknown to the emperor francis who is reputed to be most gentle upright moral and pious to princes, it has been affirmed that many of these acts were determined on without his knowledge and that others were represented to him under totally false coloring. The whole of these disgraceful proceedings must be attributed to British gold, to the finesse of Russian diplomacy, and to the passions of the Austrian aristocracy cited by the English faction, which at that time ruled Europe. The Congress broke up with mutual feelings of irritation. The emperor then expressed his sentiments in official and public documents in the most forcible language and in a tone of the highest superiority. But this he did with the view of creating a favorable impression on the public mind, for he remained so far a master of himself that though hastening to take up arms, he nevertheless demanded a renewal of the negotiations which were resumed at Prague, he deemed it advisable not to lose the advantage of constant communications. Austria would be easily detached if we obtained advantages, and she would be easily convinced if we sustained reverses. Such was the Congress of Prague. It will perhaps be asked whether Napoleon was duped by this Congress and the circumstances arising out of it. The answer is that he was not or at least not entirely, if he had not a knowledge of every fact. He was never for a moment mistaken as to the intentions and sentiments that were really entertained. Napoleon, from the moment of his first victory at Lutzen, had authentically proposed a general congress. This he conceived to be the only means of treating for universal peace, ensuring the independence of France, and the guarantee of the modern system. Every other mode of negotiation appeared to him merely a lure. And if he seemed to depart from this principle in accepting the mediation of Austria and agreeing to the conferences of Prague, it was because in proportion as time advanced, affairs became more complicated. The defeat of Vittoria, the evacuation of Spain, and the spirit of the French people, which was declining, had considerably diminished his prosperity. He could accurately guess the result of the negotiations, but he wished to gain time in his turn and to await the course of events. He was not deceived as to the part which Austria would act without knowing precisely how far she would carry her deception. He could well discern from her mysterious conduct and delays what was likely to be de her determination. At Dresden, he had even had personal conversations with the first negotiator of the Austrian government, who had sufficiently indicated the line of conduct he intended to pursue. The emperor having remarked that he had, after all, 800,000 men to oppose the enemy, the negotiator eagerly added, your majesty may say 1,200,000 for you may, if you please join our force to your own. But what was to be the price of this advantage? Nothing less than the restitution of Illyria, the sessions of the Duchy of Warsaw, the frontiers of the air. And after all, said the emperor, what should I have gained by this? Had we made all these concessions, should we not have been humbling ourselves for nothing and furnishing Austria with the means of making farther demands and afterwards opposing us with greater advantage? He never relinquished the idea that the true interests of Austria, being 
closely connected with our danger, we should be more certain of regaining her by our misfortunes than of securing her by our concessions. Napoleon was therefore deaf to every demand, but he had so little doubt of the engagements which Austria had already entered into with our enemies that he is described as having said half good-naturedly and half indignantly to the uh, Austrian negotiator, Come now, confess, tell me how much they have paid you for this. How severely did Napoleon suffer on this occasion? What trials of patience did he not undergo? And yet he was accused at the time of not wishing for peace. How was I perplexed, said he, when conversing on this subject to find myself the only one to judge the extent of our danger and to adopt means to avert it. I was harassed on the one hand by the coalesced powers who threaten our very existence and on the other hand by the spirit of my own subjects who in their blindness seem to make common cause with them by our enemies who are laboring for my destruction and by the importunities of my people and even my ministers who urged me to throw myself on the mercy of foreigners and I was obliged to maintain a good appearance in this embarrassing situation to reply haughtily to some and sharply to rebuff others who created difficulties in my rear encourage the mistaken course of public opinion instead of seeking to give it a proper direction and suffered me to be tormented by demands for peace when they ought to have proved that the only means of obtaining it was to urge me ostensibly to war. 